I once worked the night shift at a central pep center for a large funeral home group. Some of our tasks included going to the satellite locations around town to deliver casketed remains, touch up cosmetics, deliver into company mail, etc. Myself and a female coworker delivered a casket to a location late one night. And whilst there, I had to touch up some cosmetics on another case. I was leaning on the casket with my left arm, with the cosmetic in my left hand, and using my right hand with the cosmetic sponge. My coworker and I were chatting about nothing in particular, when the torsier floor lamp at the head of the casket cut out. We both paused. Still leaning on the casket, I looked up at the light and simply said, excuse me, I was using that, and the light turned back on. My coworker fled to the van in the parking lot, but since I didn't feel threatened or in any danger, I replied, thank you, I'll get finished. After I finished, turned the light back off saying, good night and thank you, and left. I was about two when I moved with my family to our new house. I slept on my crib in my own room with a few checkups from my parents every night. I had a big window right beside my bed and new black curtains which blocked the sunlight. My first encounter with the ghost, or that's what I started calling him, was when I was still a baby in my crib. He was a few meters away from me and I wasn't scared. That's my first memory of him. I don't remember much about my childhood so I can't really remember if I saw him more when I was a toddler. The next memory of the ghost is when I had my own new bed, and every time at night if I'd touch the black curtains, I would see him and almost always shift to a dreamlike place where the ghost was with me. I would do this about every night for about three to four years when I was seven. I really didn't think of it much, but being older, this one thing that always happened had stuck in my mind. I always kept the door locked and the black curtain down, and when I was in a dreamlike world, I'd instantly wake up from it if my parents were about to open my door, every single time. But when I was older, 11 I'd say, touching the black curtains would scare me, and I would avoid touching them. I haven't told this to anyone, and made my mom take the curtains off and throw them away. I'm just wondering, is there an explanation for this, or why this happened, and has this happened to other people? I really do doubt that the many memories with the ghost are my imagination's creation. Two years back, I moved to a new place for my study purpose. Everything was good, until weird things started happening with me. I wasn't sure at first, but with time, I started noticing things. My neighbours always used to ask questions like, are you alright? Is everything good inside the house? And they always stare at me weirdly whenever I go out. I thought they were trying to be nice to me because I was new to that place. I started feeling uncomfortable about the atmosphere around me. I always used to feel an unknown presence in the house, especially during the night time. Things started getting creepier from the day I noticed a ghostly reflection in the mirror. At first, I was very confused. I thought it was just my hallucination because I was disturbed about the atmosphere of that house. Later, I noticed the unknown figure twice and the moment I realised that, I wasn't hallucinating at all. The reflection was of a kid. I didn't notice the face because it disappeared in a very short interval of time. I was frozen and freaked out at that moment because I never saw something abnormal like this before. I started looking for a new house but unluckily there were no houses available for rent in that locality. I was very disturbed by knowing the fact that I have no option instead of staying in that same haunted house. I talked about this with one of my neighbours, but she hesitated to share anything about that house. She was very uncomfortable discussing this topic, so I didn't bother her much. She just said, no one can stay in that house. I decided to cleanse the house, hoping everything will be fine after that. Everything was normal for a few days, but suddenly even more paranormal activities started happening. Flickering of lights, moving of objects, breaking of photo frames, whispering and knocking sounds from the window always used to happen during the night. Due to all these happenings, I developed insomnia. 
I rarely used to sleep because whenever I try to sleep, I used to dream about that kid and my body used to paralyze. My health got worse day by day, so my parents were concerned about this. Even my mom started noticing shadow figures moving around the house during the night and she clicked a few pictures. Luckily, it got captured in one of the pictures. The figure was abnormally long with only four fingers in the hand. It was terrifying enough to scare someone to death. Later, one guy from our neighbor talked about the truth related to that house. He said before I moved here, three families stayed here and three people died in that same house. A kid died mysteriously, a man died in a sudden road accident, and also an old man died due to a heart attack. After knowing about this, we were definitely sure that the house was haunted by multiple spirits. Although, they never harmed us. It was the night of May 11th, 2020. My dear Korean War veteran grandfather had passed away due to cancer a few days before when I was told that I should spend the night with my grandmother to keep her company. All was going well until me and my grandmother decided to go to bed. Due to me being on the taller side of the family at around 5'10 or 5'11, I've been on sleeping on what my state calls a Davenport since I was a teenager whenever I spent the night. I would started to drift off but checked the time before I closed my eyes, 10 past 11. My grandmother was drifting off as well when we both heard the creepiest thing I've heard in my life. In the hallway, between where I was sleeping and my grandmother's bedroom adjacent to the bathroom, craft room and kitchen, we both heard a woman say what we believe to be either Barb, my grandmother's shortened name, or Bud, the nickname my granddad was called only by the older family members and his close friends. After I heard her speak, my eyes shot open wide, trying to figure out if it was my grandmother, though I didn't recognize it as her voice. We were all alone, so it couldn't have been a family member either. I decided to brush it off for the night and get some sleep. Morning rolls around, and while having breakfast, I asked my grandmother just on the off chance, if she heard a woman's voice in the hallway last night, which she confirmed she did indeed heard. There's a few possible guesses as to who the woman was. First is my grandmother's mom, who sadly passed away on my first birthday of a stroke, age 103. The second is my granddad's mom, who passed away in the early 90s. The third is a woman who I had seen as a child in my granddad's bedroom, who apparently was an aunt who passed away long before I was born. I feel a bit counterproductive telling this almost six months after the fact, but I just wanted to get it out there and get other people's thoughts as this is the only time in my life that I can say without a doubt that I saw a UFO. It was approximately 2.30 a.m. on Monday June 14th, 2020, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the southeastern neighborhood known as Bates Hendricks. I was able to remember the dates because it was five days before I was set to move. I'm off from work on Sundays and Mondays, so it was still technically my Sunday as I hadn't gone to bed. I got bored and decided to go for a walk around the neighborhood as I'd be leaving it soon. I was literally inches away from being back home when I saw it fly. Float feels like a more appropriate term, over. I feel like I'm contradicting myself because it simultaneously looks like every textbook description you see of flying saucers. And yet, it also looked like a ball of fire floating across the sky before disappearing behind the trees in the alley of my block. My first two logical conclusions was that it was either a meteor or one of those radio-controlled toy drones. I dismissed both as those quickly as it seemed too low on the ground to be a meteor, not to mention it wasn't making any sound. As far as being a toy drone, I had seen kids in the neighborhood playing with them in the past after dark, so I had a bit of an understanding of how those work. What really creeped me out, aside from the fact that it was the middle of the night and I was the only one out and decided to leave my phone inside the apartment, was how low it was to the ground 
and there was no way it couldn't see me. I remember thinking, I'm moving in five days, please don't abduct me tonight. After which, it continued its trajectory on a southwestern course, from what I could tell. All in all, through a UFO sighting, it was rather uneventful, but I saw it nonetheless, and was wanting to see if I could get any additional information on what it was that I saw. So I'm an older guy, in my 30s. I've since this encounter moved away from the town I grew up in and have moved on with my life. But when I was 11, the scariest shit happened to me and a friend of mine named John in a little single wide trailer on Bobo Road in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So it was a normal Friday. Me and my best buddy John decided to throw a multi-night hangout at video games and junk food. Night one was at my place PS1 and Doritos with Mountain Dew, the new Resident Evil 3 had just come out, but we were intent on beating two, both discs, so we stayed up all night and day, switching controllers out if we died, and on day one, we had all but beat Leon's story. Day two rolled around, and half awake we rode to John's mom and dad's house. John's grandfather also lived with them. He was a widowed Southern Baptist preacher who didn't do much but watch TV and smoke cigarettes and John's mom and dad liked to go out on the weekends to his mom's sister's house, so we'd be able to get back up all night. Night two started a bit rocky. We were both tired and a bit jacked on sugar and caffeine, arguing over the controller. Mr. G, John's grandfather, walked through the small door of the back room of the trailer and asked us to keep it down a little. He slept on the couch ten feet away. He informed us that there was plenty of deli turkey and bread in the fridge for us to snack on, and he was going to bed. Around 2am, John's mother called, and back then we didn't have cell phones just around. We had cordless landlines. So the call abruptly broke both our concentration, and John of course gets devoured by a zombie. And I laugh, awarding me an arm slug. John had his parents hold queen-size waterbed that took up most of the room, and the phone was wedged between the mattress and frame, so John went headfirst into the wall, putting his hand through the floor. Answered the phone and looked at me. Hey, my mom and dad are too trash to come home, so it's just us and Papa. By 2.45am, I was on a roll, deep in the bowels of the sewers of Raccoon City. John was nodding, so I woke him, and he decided a shower would wake him up. About three to five minutes after he left the room, I heard something flip off the dresser wedged in the closet. I paused the game, and then heard John's grandfather walking through the house. He was a big guy, so his footsteps echoed through the small metal box. Then I heard the water stop running, and a loud slam at the same time the gaslight outside of the back window of his room slash the trailer flickered, and I heard John scream, No! I jumped up and ran to the bathroom, where he, half on the floor, half propped up against the wall, looking up at the mirror, pale as a sheet, on the mirror, a large, much larger than mine or John's hand's handprint. And John was crying. Not boo-hoo crying, he was sobbing. Well, there was a fucking Indian in the mirror in there looking at me in his eyes. They were leaking black and he was staring right through me. At that moment, another slam. I could hear his grandfather snoring loud as could be and heavy footsteps through the back of the trailer. I helped John up and put a towel over him. I stepped around the corner to see an empty black void of nothing. The light from the TV, even though white static wasn't going past his granddad's feet. John asks, what do you see? Nothing, I say. I hear more waking. Then the faint laugh of a Tickle Me Elmo John's mom kept on a shelf over her brick PC from 95. And that fucking thing didn't have batteries in it. Haven't since it started talking on its own in the middle of the night. Along with the Furbies she had, all no batteries. Out of the dark rolls his dog's ball. He's just died that week from eating mole poison in the yard, dog. In that instant, I felt like I was going to die for some reason. As I didn't and the night pretty much wound down after that, we hid in his room with the lights on. Didn't eat, kept the game off and listened to sounds from the back room for what felt like 10 hours. 
It was three hours and 15 minutes. As I stated, I'm a grown man in my 30s. I'm a druid. I'm a skeptic believer. I'll try to debunk shit if I can, but that night was the most scared and powerless I ever felt. I've since had many experiences I'll get around to posting, but I had to share this one because I pride myself on being rather unafraid. I've dedicated my life to studying demons, magic, monsters, ghosts, etc. But that night, it stuck with me and fixed the path of my life, towers the otherworldly and mystic. I'll tell you all about the house on Cherry Street next time. It's silly to think that curses always have to be in some ancient language or involve some cursed object. Simple conditioning and the introduction of concepts can be effective. Suggestive conditioning can decide everything from your routine behavior to your own moral values. It can happen by accident or intentionally by directed towards specific individuals. Psychosomatic is a word used to describe any illness or condition caused by the subject's own mind slash psyche. Psychosomatic diseases are actually very common in the world, ranging from rashes to fatal heart diseases. Necrosis is the rapid death of cells and tissue. As the cells die, your body can't keep up and will build up masses of decomposing tissue. As this progresses, your body becomes a walking prison of rotting flesh, shaped with dips and pits exposing muscle tissue and tendons. The thing about necrosis is that it can happen for almost no reason at all. A small scratch that gets a minor infection, a spider bite, your skin getting too cold, an unnoticeable blood, blood clot, or even just poor circulation. And when one cell dies of necrosis, it can release dangerous chemicals that speed up the process for the neighboring cells. Necrosis can spread on the surface layer of your skin, or subdermally, under the skin, where it can go unnoticed and will most likely be brushed off as a new bruise, or a new ache slash pain, like we all get going about our day to day. Now, I introduced the concept of voodoo death, a term coined in 1942 by Walter Cannon, which is purely psychosomatic. Essentially, stress or fear causes the body to release a constant and sometimes subtle stream of adrenaline over time, which in turn causes blood pressure and oxygen levels to drop. This gradual lack of oxygen causes cells to wither and die, creating almost spontaneous outbreaks of necrosis through the body until eventually your heart's blood circulation systems are so damaged that you fade out of consciousness and rot to death. One night, I was driving my friend home at about 1.30 or 2 a.m. It's about a five minute drive on a road I travel almost every day. Usually, nothing creepy about it. So as I was driving down a small hill, I saw a skinny guy, looked to be maybe a teenager or young adult based on build, in a black hoodie with the hood pulled up. He was on the side of the road that would be near my passenger side and walked out in front of my car and then stopped on the yellow lines dividing the road. Obviously, as I had just seen a person in the road, I slowed my car. But when I got closer to him, it was like I blinked and he was gone. I was a little creeped out, so before I got home, I called my mom to have her come watch me from the car and tell her about it. She's not one to get freaked out about things like this, so she basically just brushed off my story. Now things get really weird. First, I need to describe the demeanor of my dog. She's super easygoing. The only time she ever barks is when we vacuum the house because she's scared of it. She loves people, and when people, even strangers, show up, she never barks. She just wants attention from them. And she's also not particularly in tune with us and our moods for a dog we've had since she was a puppy. So when my mom came to see me, the dog came with her and greeted me as usual. Nothing weird. A couple of minutes after, my mom and the dog headed back to bed, and I followed them to talk for a couple of minutes before going to bed. When we got back to my mom's bedroom, the dog hopped upon the bed like normal. A couple seconds later, out of nowhere, she turned to the corner of my mom's room 
where there's nothing and started barking and growling like crazy. We finally got her settled down and after this, my mom became creeped out and decided we would all sleep in our living room together. When we got settled in the living room, our printer in the next room turned on out of nowhere and started making noise like it was getting ready to print, but never printed anything. After this, nothing else happened. This was a couple years ago and we've had a couple small weird occurrences, but nothing crazy like that and nothing that affected the dog. Anybody have any insight as to why something may have followed me home and haunted us for one night? Anyway, we bought a house and I got no weird feelings from it like I did at other houses. My house was one room that has deteriorated from water and needs to be redone. And with the doorknob removed and the latch on the outside of the door, it's a little unsettling. We call it the dungeon. The first night in our new room, my husband was with me. So I can confirm I'm not alone in at least one of these. We're sitting so we can see directly down the town hall. The two kids' rooms at either end. We hear a sound and expect it's one of them trying to creep out. We think we've confirmed it because we see a shadow move on the wall and another creak. I tell him to go investigate and he insists our son was fast asleep and he couldn't have gotten back to bed that fast without much more noise. The cat was asleep in my daughter's room, sitting low style with his nose touching the wall. Very unusual for him, but we just moved so I let it go. My dog barked and growled at my bedroom ceiling for the first few nights. Also odd, but we just moved and he's a puppy. So I only joked about how dogs can see things. We don't and forget about it. Since then, I've had several moments where I see movement at the top of the stairs. It's always the same color. I wish I could say I was joking, but the only way I can describe it is cloud colored. Almost every time it is movement towards one specific room, but it comes from different angles. By the time I look, it's already gone behind the corner. No one is upstairs when I see these. The first time I saw it, not out of the corner of my eye, I thought I was watching a third tumbleweed bounce down the stairs. We have a golden retriever, it happens. I got up to retrieve the ball of hair and there was nothing there. But I sat there and watched it slowly and softly bounce down at least three steps. This was 20 seconds worth of intense staring. I didn't have my glasses on, so the detail wasn't all there but it's what I imagine a third tumbleweed would look like to me from that distance. It moved strangely, but we're still learning where all of the drafts come in, so I shrugged it off, but still mentioned it to my husband, because we both still chuckle about that first night. Today was the worst. I'd come out of the bathroom, which leaves a direct line of sight into my bedroom. I thought I saw the dog jump off the bed, and I heard the corresponding thump. Our dog is very light, so in the dark when the light hits him, he's an ominous looking blur and I'm used to it. But I remembered I had just let the dog outside. I called down to the husband and kids and asked where the cat was. He confirmed he was perched in the window. I don't know what I think of all this. I feel like I'm going a little crazy, but I just need to share with a group of people who don't think I'm completely nuts. In Council 1, this must have been around the year 2008 or so, it was a while back. I had just woken up, everything seemed normal, but as I was yawning, I realised that no noise came out of my mouth. Panicked, I ran to the bathroom. Mind you, it was about 8am, my parents were still sleeping. Closed the door and proceeded to try and speak. Nothing was coming out of my mouth, so I tried to scream. Nothing. I quickly ran back to my bed under the covers and proceeded to close my eyes and freak out a bit. After I opened my eyes again and I could speak, parents woke up a bit later. I asked them if I woke them up with my screaming. They seemed confused, so I disregarded it. I believe to this day that something otherworldly played with me as I felt very unusually lethargic and short of breath slash consciousness even after waking up. 
Before you ask, no, it wasn't my ears. I could hear everything around me. My parents would have heard me even with the door closed as the bathroom was across the very narrow corridor from their rooms. Encounter two, still in the same apartment on the 15th floor like the last encounter. I live in a cheaper slash old person downtown region of a small but very populated city. This must have been around a year ago or so. I can't exactly remember. It was a normal night for the most part. It was probably around 3 a.m. I couldn't for the life of me fall asleep that night. I kept tossing and turning, but couldn't fall asleep. Suddenly, with a loud voice, I heard, get down on the ground, followed almost immediately by three gunshots. As soon as I hear this, I jump from my bed and look down through my window. Surely enough, I see the red and blue lights and three cop cars. Curious, I start looking around at all the condos and shorter apartments to see if anyone else is watching, but I see absolutely nobody. I must have been looking for a solid minute until out of nowhere, everything becomes silent and I see no lights. As soon as this happens, I hear three loud and fast knocks at my door with an ominous white light around the doorframe. Somehow, I managed to fall asleep, but the morning after, I was terrified. Weirdest part is, I tried for the best part of a week to check the news and police reports on a shooting incident, but no matter how hard I looked, I found absolutely nothing. This happened a few days ago, Friday, October 23rd. It was about 9am. I was laying in bed, drifting in and out of a doze, about to wake up for the day. All of a sudden, I hear a loud beeping, one single second tone. Kind of like how an intercom might sound before someone speaks into it, but the sound was extremely high pitched. Immediately after, I hear an unfamiliar male voice say, something is coming. I of course freak out and look around my room in a panic. My fiancé left for work at 7am, so I should be the only person in the house. I didn't see anything out of place and lay back down to quietly listen. Then I hear the telltale tapping of rain on the roof. It was about to start storming. I instantly realised my fiancé would have let my two pups outside when he left, and I went to let them inside. Thankfully, they were 100% dry. This was a big deal for me, because I had just gotten home from the hospital the night before. I was getting over pneumonia and a punctured lung, so trying to dry those pups off would have been almost impossible for me to do at the time. I could barely walk to the door to get the dogs in as it was. When I was able to make it back to the bed, I checked my phone and told my fiancé about what had just happened. I also checked my sound at this time and found it was on vibrate, so it couldn't have made that beeping that jolted me from my dozing. I had no alarms on and no messages either. Nothing else in our home could have made the noise I heard. In my opinion, something warned me that the storm was coming, so that I could go get my dogs without issue. I have no idea who or what it could be, or if it was just my imagination. All I know is that I'm thankful it happened and I was able to keep my pups out of the rain. This was a few years ago now. It was the middle of summer at 2.30 or so am. Me and my sister were driving home and stopped at a 7-Eleven at the corner, just a few hundred feet from our subdivision. I was getting her candy for when I looked over in the corner of the parking lot and there was a girl as described. She had messy uncombed hair with leaves and twigs in it. There's a small set of woods behind the 7-Eleven she was in her early 20s. She was crouched like a baseball catcher, hugging this weird leather satchel. And when I took a few steps towards her to see if she was okay, her head sprung up and locked onto me. I remember being terrified as she walked really quickly out of the darkness and right at me. I got back in the car really quick and locked the doors. She kept walking towards the car, but instead of going to the window, she walked around to the front of the car and stared right at us, all the while 
hugging that weird leather satchel that looked like it was from the turn of the 20th century. She also had a hospital gown on like I'd never seen before. It was solid white besides some dirt on it, like she may have been crawling through the woods. I remember she had no shoes or socks on either. She never said a word or even made an expression really. Maybe sadness or distress was all you could tell. We stared back at her for what felt like minutes, but was realistically probably just 20 or so seconds before my sister pulled out and drove down the road. We talked about her attire immediately after leaving and decided we'd turn back and call the police if she was still there, assuming she was an ex escaped mental patient or something. We turned around quickly and drove back no more than two minutes later, but there wasn't a trace of her. We drove down each direction looking for her because it was just so bizarre to us. We wanted to help her thinking at the time she must have had mental issues and escaped the hospital or something. There were a few problems with our theory though when we got to actually thinking about it. There aren't any mental hospitals anywhere near where we live, nor regular hospitals. Second and most important, to me anyway, she had a solid white, very old looking medical gown and was hugging this really odd leather satchel. Something like I'd never seen before. It looked like something straight from the early 1900s. I remember fixating on that bag when she stood in front of our car. It looked so out of place and so did her gown. It had no pattern, just dirty marks on it. I don't know what this could have been. It's the scariest thing I've ever experienced. I keep thinking I should call the cops to report this in case a woman that matches her description is missing in my area or maybe she was sex trafficked and escaped or something. But why wouldn't she just ask for help if that was the case? She certainly didn't act like someone looking for help. This is the reason I started to believe 100% in the paranormal. It still just makes my skin crawl every time I pass that 7-Eleven or go into it. That's all I can think about, especially if I pass it late at night. It still gives my whole body chills. Sorry if I repeated myself a lot or got onto rambling. It's just a life-changing experience for me and I get all out of whack when thinking about it. Anybody have any logical explanation of this? The pairing of the old all-white medical gown and the brown leather satchel makes me struggle so hard as to where she could have come from, other than something like a mental hospital or being kidnapped and escaped. Maybe somehow she had the bag to try and use it to identify who kidnapped her or something, I don't know. My mind struggles trying to find a reasonable explanation as to what the hell she was. It still sometimes feels like a figment of my imagination, but me and my sister both experienced it and we get so creeped out whenever anyone brings it up. Maybe she somehow fell through time or something. I don't know. It's just the most bizarre thing in my life. God, I get so scared thinking back to when she started making a beeline right at me and walking out from the dark for me to see she was in a hospital gown holding that creepy ass bag. Ugh, so fucking weird. So goddamn scary. So I've had a few Hatman experiences, but none are like what I've seen others have. I'm 24 years old and have been seeing him around my parents' house since I was very little, maybe four at the youngest. A little set up about my parents' house. It's in the south and was built in 1920. It's a very old and small farmhouse. Every room connects in a big circle, apart from the kitchen and dining room which come off the living room. First encounter. I was around four or five years old. I know I hadn't started school yet and my brother and sister had. They were at friends' houses this night while my dad was at work. Me and my mother were sitting in the living room which has a small hallway that leads to a bathroom in it. The bathroom then connects to my bedroom which connects to my parents' bedroom which connects to the living room where me and my mom are. So we see the bathroom light flicker from the living room and my mom is visibly afraid of this. We're Italian Catholic, so she has a big fear of demons and ghosts and such, as her parents were straight from Italy. But me seeing her scared, and me being the only boy in the house, just me and her, 
I got up to check it out, even though she told me not to. Well, when I run into the bathroom, I see the light flicker to on one last time. And as I walk in, I see a very tall shadow man with a fedora-like hat walk into my room. The light switch for the bathroom is right next to the door to my room. And this guy is tall, taller than anyone in my family. He reached the top of the doorway, so he was about six feet and some inches. Everyone in my house is between 5'3 and 5'10. Well, I chased him to see who this was, being a dumb kid. And I chased him from my room, to my parents, to the living room with my mom. I saw him walk through the doorway to the living room, but when I got in there, it was just my mom and I. Asked if she'd seen him, and she said no. Leaving me confused, I didn't even know what ghosts or demons were at this point. Second encounter. I was around six or seven at this time, and I was laying in bed very late one night on the top bunk, and I see someone from my parents' room walk into my room. I assumed it was my dad because it sounded like a man walking, but I was supposed to be asleep, so I just pretended I was. But being on the top bunk, I couldn't see the door to my parents' room from where I was. So it wasn't until the man walked into the middle of the room, I saw it was the very same tall man with a fedora-like hat on again. I still didn't move, but I watched him go up to my closet and go into it. And I just sat there waiting for him to come out until I fell asleep. I never did see him come out of the closet. Third encounter. This one was more recent in 2020. I had moved back into my parents' house the year before to help with some medical issues my mom was having and had to stay there due to COVID. My brother also still lives there too. So one night I'm chilling in my room again and the door to the bathroom is open and out of the corner of my eye while on my laptop, I see someone looking at me from behind the doorway, peeking out at me. I thought it was my brother and he needed my help for something. So I take off my headphones and look over and I stare at him, the hat man again. We just sat there observing each other from a few seconds before he quickly goes behind the doorway. I would like to mention this doorway is maybe four inches of wall behind it from where he was peeking out before the wall turns to the longer wall in the bathroom. The other side of the longer wall is the closet in my room. I've seen him peek many times and walk past doorways many times over my whole life and we've always lived in that same house. These are just my most major encounters with him and I've never seen him stay peeking for any amount of time when I look to him other times. I also want to mention that around 12 or 13 years old, my mother put crosses over almost every doorway in the house, except my closet door and the two doors that lead the bathroom, one of those being in my room and the other in the hall. I always see him in those areas now too, where the crosses aren't, like he's trapped between that hall, the bathroom, the closet and my room. It's almost like a small little square of the house with walls separating the rooms. Another note, I'm not the only one who's seen him in my house. My brother, sister and mom have as well. And they all described him the same way as I did before. I even told them I'd seen him. I also hear him walking around and a few times I was home alone showering and had the door to the hallway locked and someone jiggled the doorknob on one more than one occasion like they wanted to come through. But when I'd get out, I'd check around the house and find no one home. Another time, me and my brother were in our room and heard three knocks come from inside the closet while the door was closed. We both looked at each other, looked at the door and said, fuck that, and kept on our computers and ignored it. I also want to mention that at no point in seeing that man have I ever felt fear, but the opposite. He's always felt friendly and lost. I've only felt fear when the doorknob shook for several days and when the three knocks came from the closets. I also want to mention I believe my house has others wandering the same area as the hat man, as me and my siblings have seen and heard other things that don't fall in line with the hat man we know. I can write about those in another post and or add their hat man stories to this one if you'd all like. I was just wondering if this is the hat man we're seeing. Or if this is just another shadow person or ghost in our home that happens to wear a hat also. 
since it seems most people see that man when they have sleep paralysis. Yet I've seen him only once while in bed and many times out of it. And it seems most people fear him. Yet for us, he's never driven negative emotions from us. We moved into our new home in December of 2015. The place had been built in 1961 and was a nice sprawling ranch on an acre of land in a great neighbourhood. The lady who owned the house had only lived there a year before and her significant other parted ways and she needed to sell. The place was a tiny bit run down. The yard was overgrown and it looked a little sad. But it had great bones, and we were looking forward to living in a bigger house that was all on one level. When we were having inspections done, we talked to the lady who was selling us the house. She told us that she bought the house from a long-time owner, who sold it after her husband had passed away. Let's call them Mike and Mary. Once we all got all moved in, my wife took a week off to personalise the place. One of the rooms was a small library slash study type room with a wet bar and a bunch of bookshelves. In that room was a large oak railroad desk upon which our daughter had left a bunch of her stuff. As my wife was cleaning the desk off, she knocked over a water bottle and it fell onto the floor. She picked it up and set it on the corner of the now clean desk and walked out of the room. She did some work in the bedroom and as she was walking down the hallway past the office, she happened to glance and was dumbstruck. On the desk was the water bottle, in the middle of the desk and standing upside down on its lid. She immediately called me to tell me what had happened and I assured her that she probably wasn't paying attention and just put the bottle on the desk upside down. When I got home that afternoon, she was waiting for me holding the bottle and said, try it. It took countless attempts before I could actually get the bottle to stand upside down because the lid was slightly convex. Being the rational one, I told her that the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one. She got annoyed with me, but she agreed that ghosts are probably not the most rational explanation. I settled into sorting stuff from the move and I heard her call me from the hallway. She was holding a framed picture in her hands. She pointed to the floor and said, look, on the floor, was a perfect puddle of water. She had leaned the prince against the wall where she was going to hang it and walked away to get her hammer. When she came back, the picture frame was soaking wet and there was a puddle of water on the floor. The day was bright and sunny and there hadn't been any water on the floor when she set the painting down. Besides, that wouldn't explain why there was water on the part that wasn't touching the floor. I went into the crawl space to check the pipes and there was no water line that ran under the hallway. So they all went straight back to the kitchen and then over to the bathrooms. Nowhere near the place this occurred. By this time I was freaked out, but to calm my wife's nerves, I told that we, or our daughter, probably spilled something on the frame and floor without realizing it. She wasn't buying it. The next day when I went to work, she walked around the house and spoke to the ghost assuming that it was Mike's spirit. She told him that he was free to stay as long as he felt it necessary, but to please stop doing things like that because he's scaring her and we promised that we would take care of the house. After that, her experiences stopped, but my daughter and I still saw and heard things. One day, while getting ready, a cat walked into the bedroom and walked back out. At first, I thought it was my cat, but this one was bigger than mine. So I called out to my wife and said, where's the cat? She replied, he's outside. Why? I couldn't answer. I was dumbfounded. To keep from freaking her out though, I just made up some excuse like, I was just wondering. At this point, all skepticism had abandoned me and I was starting to realize there was indeed a ghost in our house. It was then that, while looking through a file drawer of old receipts for upgrades to the house, that Mary had left when she had moved out. I found an envelope full of photos of Mary and Mike remodeling the master bedroom. It was obvious from the photos that they loved the house, 
and they would still be living there had he not passed away. We decided to put the photos back in the drawer and leave them alone. It felt a bit weird to be looking at them. They had also left something interesting stuff in the garden. Heart-shaped stepping stones, garden gnomes in little hiding places, etc. Every time I found something that seemed personal, I tried to leave it alone out of respect. I decided to start ignoring some of the weird stuff that went on in the house. I occasionally heard footsteps and, especially in the garage slash workshop, puddles of water would appear on the floor. The strangest thing that I can recall happened four years ago. While I had always been into cars a little, there was one car I desp despised. That was the Corvette. Even when I was a little kid, I never really thought they were cool. Then four years ago, I decided I was going to buy a Corvette. I don't know why, but it was all I could think about. I joined Corvette forums, started researching them like crazy until finally I bought one. The entire time, I couldn't figure out why I wanted one, but after I got mine, I was irrationally happy. Two years ago, my wife and I were taking a long road trip, and as you do, we were talking about all kinds of stuff when the subject drifted to Mike and Mary. It was at that point that we realized that, aside from the fact that he died, we knew nothing about Mike. I decided to see if I could at least find his obituary online and sure enough, thanks Google, we found it. He was apparently a great guy, well loved and traveled. He died from pneumonia at a fairly young age of 63. People from all over the world had commented about how much they loved him, etc. The obituary had a photo of him holding his cat, which, sure enough, was the cat I saw. The freakiest thing of all, though, was one line in the obituary which read, he loved cars of all kinds, especially Corvettes. There isn't much of an ending to this. We still live in the house. Strange occurrences have tapered off to the point that they're either not happening or we're not noticing. We have thought about contacting Mary to see if she would like the photos, but I don't want to bring back any painful memories. This occurred when I was seven years old. Bit of backstory though. I came from a very abusive childhood, both physically and emotionally, never sexually. I'd never had a Christmas present, never a birthday present or card or even a cake on special occasions. I didn't have my first birthday cake till I was in my twenties. Friends found out and made up for my arsehole parents. Anyway, it was one of those nights when I was beaten and locked in my room, left to cry in the darkness the pain from the punches to my face burning as my tears rolled down my face. There was a rattle at the door where the lock was on the other side of the door. Thinking it was one of my parents, I tried to hide behind the bed as best I could to shield myself further. Peeking over the bed sheets, the door opened a sliver and then closed. Thinking my parents had changed their mind on coming into the room and going back downstairs, I sat back on the bed, the tears still falling the pain still present. It was then I noticed that there was no sound of my parents' footsteps moving away from my room. At that moment, I felt a small hand, not that much smaller than my hand at the time, touching my cheek. It was icy cold, but the moment it touched my skin, the pain faded away. I almost felt calm instantly, and the crying stopped. The touch then warmed slightly, then disappeared. I slept the whole night through, unfortunately, without bedwetting that night, only to find a small teddy bear beside my pillow. My parents saw me with it in the morning, grasping it close. They immediately started fighting with each other, screaming, why did you get him that fucking thing? And I didn't get him it. You must, you must have, you bitch. And so on and so on. So clearly, neither of them had a slight change of heart. But whenever I needed comfort, the bear helped me remember that moment of the soothing touch and helped me get through some really bad times. Cut to me leaving my parents' house years later. I had to pack bit by bit, keeping a few bags of clothes and boxes stored in the attic out of their way. I left with very little, and it was one of my close friends that was helping me leave as soon as the coast was clear from them. It was time to leave. 
my teddy appeared in my hand and grabbed my bag. On the back of the attic, however, was a pile of stuff that had been left by the previous owner of the house, which my parents didn't throw out. There was a photo frame covered in cloth. I pulled away the fabric and found it was a family portrait. In the photo was a small young girl who couldn't have been more than five years old in the portrait, with her parents, and in her small hands was the teddy bear that had appeared beside me all those years ago, that I still have to this day. I looked at this portrait, my teddy and my bag, and left without looking back. I needed to find out who lived at that house before my parents, so after contacting a few people to help track down the people in the portraits, I made contact with them and met them at their home. As it turned out, their small daughter had passed away at the age of five from cancer. The portrait was made not long before she passed away. I showed them the teddy bear and they wondered how I got it. I told them my experience and their eyes filled with tears of joy. They told me that before their daughter passed away, she spoke that she wanted her bear to help someone that needed him as she did. The little girl's name was Anna. The portrait was returned to her parents, but they told me that I was to keep the bear as their daughter wanted me to have it. I'll never forget that touch from that night. The feeling of calm that washed over me, the relief from the pain and the power that teddy bear has gotten me through. One of the first things ever experienced in that house was experienced by my aunt maybe 11 or 12 years ago. My aunt used to live with us and she had a job where she had to leave very early in the morning because of the hour commutes from our house to her job. She was leaving our house at around 5 a.m. When she walked outside, she saw something that looked like a man behind her car. Keep in mind, it was pitch black outside, kind of like he was inspecting it. And he didn't notice my aunt. And before he could, my aunt ducked behind a support beam of our porch and just waited there until the guy left. But suddenly he stopped moving. My aunt's waiting and waiting, but this guy wasn't moving here at all, just idle. Then it hit my aunt. She had pepper spray in her bag. She grabbed the spray out of her back, looked over the corner and saw the guy fully go behind her car out of her view. With the spray in her hand, she charged him for nothing to be there. She swears that she knows she saw something but can't explain it. Now the first experience I ever had was about nine years ago. I was about seven at the time and was asleep downstairs on the couch where I liked to fall asleep watching TV with my dad. And the only people who were home were me, my dad, and my brother who was five at the time. My dad and my brother were upstairs in my parents' room so I was the only one downstairs at the time. My mom, who works night shifts, and my aunt had already left for work, I presume. As my aunt would have probably been downstairs with me, and my mom leaves my house at about 9 a.m., 9 p.m., and doesn't get home till 8 p.m. Now my couch points directly towards our fireplace. So if I'm laying on my side, like I was, the first thing I see is my fireplace. So when I woke up, it was weird not to be seeing my fireplace, which is when my eyes adjusted to the darkness and I could see a lady standing there, she looked possibly Mexican or Puerto Rican. I'm not entirely sure as she was wearing what looked like to be a dress or a maid's outfit and she was just back, staring at me. All I could do was stare back at her. I didn't know what else to do or say when she said, LA. LA, LA. It freaked me out so much I just put my head under the blankets and fell back asleep. And I couldn't explain what happened and my brother thinks it was probably a dream. My brother always hears stuff in the house, supposedly weird noises. People talking, someone calling his name and one of the weirdest experiences he's had is hearing somebody yelling while home alone. Take this story with a grain of salt as he's a liar and lies about a bunch of stuff. At the time he was maybe 12 and I was 14 with me, my mom and my dad were going to a concert. My aunt no longer lived with us. So my brother was home alone with my parents. 
trusted him to be alone. So after he was home alone, he was just playing video games when he heard somebody scream his name as if they were, quote, getting stabbed. He thought it was our mom. And then he realized that he couldn't be her because we had left to the concert. He then tried to listen closer and the lady kept screaming his name over and over. So we locked his door. He thought maybe it was a burglar or something and he just kept quiet. He ended up falling asleep in his room closet where we found him when we got home after. My dad had to open his room door with a key. He told us what happened and my dad went looking around the entire house without finding anyone or anything that looked like someone could have broken in. Another time, me and my mom were watching TV when we both had seen something above the TV, almost as if it was a person's shadow floating. And then he drifted to the right and disappeared. We couldn't explain at all. It didn't look like smoke or anything. And nothing was burning to produce smoke anyways. And we can't explain what we had seen that day. One of the most recent things we've experienced was about a one year ago when my grandma had come over to visit us and she slept in the guest room. The guest room has a walk-in closet which has a door that opens with the slightest push. And my grandma was woken up by the sound of rustling in the closet. She put her glasses on and saw two beady eyes in the closet staring at her. The first thing she could think of was a scream very loud. She woke up the entire house and we all came in to see what was happening. When she told my dad what happened, he looked inside the closet for anybody, but nothing was there. He tried to see if something maybe made the shape of eyes, but nothing in there looked like something that could be mistaken as eyes and my grandma couldn't explain it. Maybe somebody could debunk all of these things, but to us, they were all real experiences. And I just wanted to put it online and see if anybody had similar experiences with weird stuff like this. Apparently, it's not normal. And what I saw still scares me to this day. Heck, my own grandfather said he saw it too sometimes. So silly little kid me, always thought that everyone's house had demons with red eyes, living in closets growing up. I didn't learn otherwise until I was about 13, when someone told me that I was paranoid. I was at a sleepover and was anxious about keeping my friend's closet door shut as I slept. In fact, I was certain she had a red-eyed demon too. She quite literally had the entire room's lights turned off, and I had to have my sleeping bag right in front of the closet all night. I didn't see red eyes, just so you all know. So when I was 20, I went to stay at my grandmother's and did some recording and work on some photo albums for her. I remember her saying she used to check the closet doors in the guest room when I slept in there because I kept saying I saw demons with red eyes in a closet. She never told me when I started to see them, though she was convinced it was when I was five or six. Years later, my sister was staying with her and started to ask about the red eyes. She never asked me about it until after my grandmother died. She saw other weird stuff in the house, but she remembered the whole red eyes thing too. She just told my mother who blew it off. To this day, I can't sleep with the closet door open at night. I also made sure I had Legos on the floor. So if there was something in there, I would have to endure some pain because I seriously thought all demons were barefoot. I was a little kid when I thought that out. My sister passed in 2019 due to medical reasons and while she and I were close, every now and then weird things happen. I'm used to ghosts because I've seen an orange tabby which was mine named Kurtz. He passed away in 2011. He follows me around or I feel him near me as I sleep. Recently, I was asleep when I heard my sister yelling at me. Usually, I involuntarily kick in my sleep and when I heard her voice, that's exactly what happened. My fiance was the person I kicked and it woke him before he fell on the floor. 
My fiance is convinced my sister was trying to wake me to prevent him from falling and hitting his head on the bookshelf and seriously hurting himself. The other experience with her ghost was when I was at my parents' house to visit her son. My nephew was really bad at math and for some reason I heard my sister's voice saying, he's just like you, you hate it too. I was about to reply because it sounded like she was sitting right next to me. I looked confused as my nephew walked over with his homework and said, Mom said you to ask you to show me how to multiply fractions. I'm bad at other math problems, but fractions are my best friend. I was very confused because I asked my mother if she told my nephew and she said no. Remember, you used to show your sister how to multiply fractions all the time. Remember? So I did it but I was very confused. After a while, I went downstairs to the guest room, my sister's old room. My sister's cat, Chester, was acting very weird all night. He's usually very friendly and kind of like a furry bowling ball. That night, he was sitting at the foot of the bed, staring, and then he started to act just like my cat, Kurt. When I mean act like my cat, he curled by my head and purred, while Chester never does. Then I heard my sister saying again, are you reading that book? Reference to that book is The Thief of Always by Clive Barker. I wasn't scared, more perplexed because after she died, the book utterly vanished. We haven't found it since. In the book is a picture of my sister in front of Sirius Black's house at Universal Studios. My mom has also heard my sister asking about the book too. She still hasn't figured out the reference yet, so I haven't had time to tell her. For one, I will name my experiences and the weird sensations it caused. The first one was when I was between six to eight. My grandmother and grandfather had a nightlight in the hall that you could see almost into the living room. But that night, I couldn't see at all. It was like a black mass. It was so black that I couldn't see the atomic orange Barco lounge my grandfather loved and my grandmother hated. Why I was out of bed that late was strange in itself. I was in the hall heading to the bathroom. Then I got this pressure on my ears, like the kind where your ears would pop. So I ended up in the bathroom holding a Q-tip. Just as I was about to put it into my left ear, my grandfather came into the bathroom. He asked what was wrong and I told him. He went to get a heat compressor to help pop my ears. I never told him about what I saw or felt. Fast forward to when I was 15 or 16. We came for Christmas because my dad killed our Christmas tree. I was sleeping in the living room and when I woke, I realized my period started, but that didn't cause what I saw. I thought it did, but my sister confirmed years later, I didn't have a dream or slept, walked or hallucinated. I remember waking up and walking into the dining area. My grandmother was sitting across from my dad talking about getting a Christmas tree. I walked in. And then according to my dad, all the color went from my face. What I saw standing behind my grandmother to this day scares me. It was a boy dressed in brown overalls like from the 1900s. He was looking over her shoulder, but when he realized I could see him, he turned to look at me. There was a black pit where her face ought to be and red eyes just staring at me. I went back to the fold out bed and I was terrified. Yeah, my period was a pain, but what I saw could not vocalize until I was nearly 25 years old. I never told my mother what I saw, nor my grandmother. When I was 25, my sister who was staying with my grandmother due to her being ill, called me in a panic. After my grandmother was placed in a nursing home, something was going on. My sister asked me if I knew our grandmother's house was haunted. I gave her a vague response as I was still haunted by what I saw as a teenager. My sister asked for my help, so I, being the spiritual one in the family, gave her two seals I created and blessed as I'm a Wiccan. I had to give instructions and also to place the seals in certain hidden areas of the house. One was in a plain site which was a utility room slash bathroom, which my sister said was the focus area. I told her one seal goes in her wallet and stays with her all the time in that house. She also couldn't tell her boyfriend or friend who stayed at the house about it. 
Eventually, her boyfriend did ask me why I said it. It was for his safety. The house was sold right after my grandmother died. We never knew what it was that haunted that place. My grandmother was a very negative person. And though my grandfather tried to make the house light and happy, whatever it was just sucked the life out of them. I'm convinced I saw a demon. One day, I asked my sister about what it was, and she described something almost exactly what I saw at 15 or 16. And I suddenly said, and I thought I was the only one who saw it. She seemed shocked, and I told her what I saw that Christmas holiday so long ago. She also said my seals seemed to scare that thing into the back bathroom. I'm still convinced it was a demon, and somehow my own seals were what scared it. To this day, I still place seals in places I live for protection. They just bring me comfort.